SAO has always been a world filled with these highly complex and interesting new concepts, a lot of which I've always wanted to talk about but never really had time to delve into. But now that we're approaching the climax of the final season, I once again have the urge to make a video on it. So here's a brief explanation on the backstory of each of the Integrity Knights and their seemingly overpowered divine object weapons. Starting with the literal legend himself, we first have Berkuli Synthesis 1. Before this man became the leader of the Integrity Knights that we know today, he was first the founder of a very small remote village in the northernmost parts of the Empire. You see, Berkuli had lived during the time before Canela had secured absolute power. It was a time when the Axiom Church was still in the infancy of its development. As it began to extend its rule over the Empire, Berkuli became known as the hero who would oppose its reign. He despised everything that the Church was doing. But even with his exceptional swordsmanship, it was an organization far too powerful for him and his allies to take on alone. So rather than continue to fight Canela and her regime, Berkuli instead took his people to the north and founded his own village, the village of Rulid. And it was here that his myth with the Northern White Dragon would be formed. Now, after spending some time as the village's chief, Berkuli would one day stumble into the Northern Cave where he would find a passage between the Dark Territory and the Empire. His curiosity led him to want to cross into this unknown domain. But before that could happen, Canela had become aware of Berkuli's intent and decided to abduct him. This gave her the opportunity to experiment with his Fluctlight, resulting in him losing most of his memories. Now, Berkuli wasn't exactly turned into an Integrity Knight immediately after he was abducted. It was only after Cardinal escaped that Canela saw the need to create powerful soldiers that showed absolute obedience to her. Until that time came, Berkuli was basically kept as Canela's guinea pig, constantly kept in a form of stasis until it was time for the next experiment. When finally subjected to the Synthesis Ritual, Berkuli would become the first Integrity Knight of the Order, and his job was to fight against the Warriors of the Dark Territory. It was after numerous battles that he was eventually sent back to the Northern Cave to kill the White Dragon guarding the border, a feat he normally wouldn't have been able to do had he not had his time-piercing sword. This was a divine object forged from the system clock left behind by the Craters of the Underworld, a clock that was directly connected to the server's clock, allowing it to be able to directly influence time in the Underworld. So, since Berkuli's blade was formed from the hands of this clock, that meant that the blade itself could also do the same, bringing us to the actual abilities of this weapon. As I'm sure you're already aware, every divine object can be further enhanced via the Sacred Art Ritual of Armament Full Control. This was basically every Integrity Knight's ultimate ability. For the Time Piercing Sword, this art came in two separate phases. A strengthening phase that allows him to slash the future, and a releasing phase that allows him to slash the past both of which interfered with the perception of time. During the strengthening phase, any slash of his sword would be preserved in place until a set time in the future. Once that time would come, the force of the attack would then be unleashed in whatever location that it was set in. So it's basically an attack that requires Berkuli to predict where his opponents are going to be. On the other hand, the releasing phase is a little bit more complex and a lot more overpowered. Because of the Underworld's virtual nature, there exists a log that tracks all movement from every human unit in the system for the past 10 minutes, and it's data that can be manipulated by Berkuli's sword. It can make the system think that his attack took place at whatever location he wanted within the past 10 minutes, allowing Berkuli to align his attacks with his opponent's position regardless of where they are. His attack will always hit so long as he strikes a position that they've stood in within the past 10 minutes. Not only that, but because this is an attack that directly interferes with the system, it will always bypass the target's durability, essentially making this a defense-piercing move that is both unblockable and undodgeable. Now, as we move on to the next knights in the Order, not too many of them have a well-developed backstory like Berkuli's. Excluding the experimental children, we do know that half of the Integrity Knights are people who have broken the Taboo Index, while the other half are winners from the Four Empires Unity Tournament. So if we consider that the tournament was established after the Integrity Knights came into existence, then we can assume that the earlier knights like Fanatio were people who broke the Taboo Index. Other than that, we really only know Fanatio Synthesis II as Berkuli's apprentice. There was however a time before the events of Alicization where she had to fight Fixer Olshasta, the commander of the Dark Knights. This was one of the moments that led her to want to fight with her face fully covered. You see, she believes that when her opponents find out that she's a woman that they never really end up taking the fight seriously. 
So, in order to avoid that situation, she prefers to fight with her helmet on while keeping her opponents at a distance. Using a combination of personally developed consecutive hit techniques and armament control arts to do so. Much like Berkuli's time-altering blade, Fanatio's heaven-piercing sword also has its own history. It was a direct result of one of Canela's many experiments. For this one in particular, she had gathered as much silver as she could from across the Empire, using the element to create as many mirrors as she could. With 1,000 mirrors at her disposal, she then used them to reflect the light of Solus onto a central point, creating a very powerful beam of light in the process. The purpose of this experiment was to be able to create an attack without having to use a chant. But after seeing how much work was needed just to create a single beam, Canela felt that this just wasn't practical. So she decided to scrap the entire experiment. But rather than disregard the thousand mirrors that she had just created, she instead forged them together to make the heaven-piercing sword, allowing the user to replicate that powerful beam of light without having to prepare a chant. So Fanatio can project at will a reflection of light that's capable of melting through stone typically causing these miniature explosions of heat on impact. Now, aside from this single target attack, the sword also has a second phase to its AFC that does some pretty devastating AoE damage. If the second phase is activated, the sword will indiscriminately fire that same beam of light in every direction, creating an area of attack that not even the person holding the sword is safe from. Next, we have Dusselbert Synthesis 7, yet another person who likely became an Integrity Knight after breaking the Taboo Index. Just like Venatio, not much is known about his backstory either, but we do know that he does have lingering memories of the wife that he once had before the Synthesis Ritual. Now, his time as a knight was mainly spent overseeing the northern parts of the Nolengarth Empire, an area of land that also included a ruled village. After taking Alice into custody, his memory of the event was completely removed and he was then promoted to a guard of the Central Cathedral. It was as this guard that we first got to see him use the Conflagrant Flame Bow, a longbow forged from the phoenix that once lived in a volcano found in the southern regions of the Empire. Due to its high durability, he can easily launch over 30 arrows simultaneously. But where this weapon shines is of course with its AFC, an enhancement that sets the bow itself on fire. While in this state, neither the string nor the arrow is needed to attack. All Dusselbert needs to do is draw the bow as if he would normally, then a massive arrow of flames will appear. The farther back he pulls the bow, the greater the size of the arrow will become, resulting in these massive horizontal pillars of flame that decimate everything in its path. Should the arrow start to lose its strength mid-flight, then it can change itself into its phoenix form and gain back some of its lost momentum, generating a massive heat wave in the process. That being said, the bow can also provide options for some close-range combat. If Dusselbert wanted, he could gather the bow's flames within his own hands and literally fight people with fists of fire, something that we didn't really get to see in the anime. Moving on to Sheita Synthesis 12, she was one of the first Integrity Knights to be recruited from the Four Empires Unity Tournament, and it was this event that heavily influenced her to become the character that we see in the anime, specifically with regards to the aspect of her being so silent. You see, Sheita was a very skilled swordswoman, because of this, she was given the right to participate in the tournament, but Sheta was a bit too skilled for her own good. It was a classic case of being unable to control her own power. Whatever opponent or object she would come across, she would always visualize turning it into a cleanly cut cross-section. Sure, that may have been a weird thing to do, but that image of hers would always end up becoming a reality, turning her into a very fearsome foe. It was for this reason that every person she faced in the tournament ended up dying to her blade. Keep in mind that it wasn't very typical for people to die during the tournament. This wasn't a battle royale or a fight to the death. It was simply a competition intended to determine who the strongest warrior was. So because this tournament had taken such a gruesome turn, Canela had all records of the event erased from the system. Sheta was still declared the winner, but Canela didn't want the records of the Four Empires tournament to have this one dark spot on it. Now, it was after Sheta became an Integrity Knight that Canela offered her a blade that was suitable to her, uh, talents. What she offered was a sword that could cut through anything. The only thing Sheta needed to do to get it was retrieve a single material. So, she was ordered to go to a battlefield located deep within the Dark Territory tasked with the mission of finding any form of life that remained. This battlefield was once the location of the Dark Territory's last and largest war, 
which meant that whatever it is she would find would undoubtedly be filled with the spatial energy left behind from the casualties. This would ensure that that object would be filled with a massive amount of latent power. Shaita would spend the next three days searching through this immense battlefield, failing to find anything that was living until finally coming across a single black lily. This would be the material Canela would use to forge her paper-thin black lily sword. A small yet deadly blade that is capable of cutting through pretty much anything. A blade that made her even stronger than she was before. Now, this just made her the target of multiple duels. You see, the reason Shaita was so quiet in the first place was because she wanted to avoid having to duel people. She knew that the outcome was always going to be the same. So, she felt that by ignoring people, they too would ignore her in return. But one day there came an Integrity Knight who convinced her to accept their duel. And of course it just ended up with that person dying. It was yet another unnecessary death that she was now responsible for. A fact that was certainly taking a toll on her mind. So Shaita felt that the only way to truly avoid these situations was to just be completely removed from them. So at her own request, Shaita had herself put into hibernation. Only after Canela was defeated was she reawoken by Berkuli to assist with the upcoming war. Finally, we have Dakura Synthesis 22. An interesting integrity knight not only for her lack of a divine object weapon, but also because she's one of the few who we know broke the taboo index. Dakira was a girl raised in the southern regions of the empire. Born to a poor family of fishermen, there wasn't really anything special about her. The only notable attribute she possessed was her physical strength that could rival a man's. Of course, this wasn't enough to get her noticed by Canela, or even have her qualified for the Four Empires tournament. No. What got her noticed by the system was her own actions. You see, Dakira had fallen in love with another girl from her village. A girl with whom she wanted to tell her feelings to but could never muster up the courage to do so. Knowing this was something that wasn't allowed to happen, Dakira went to her local church to ask for forgiveness from the goddess Stasia. But she wasn't aware that the church's altar was connected to the central cathedral, allowing the church to become aware that she had broken the taboo index. This is what led to her capture and eventual transformation into an Integrity Knight. Now, because Dakira wasn't a very powerful individual, she didn't make for an elite Integrity Knight either. They found that she just didn't have the ability to hold her own in battle. That's why she was taken in by Fanatio to become one of her subordinates. Fanatio felt that she could teach Dakira some techniques that could increase her survivability in battle. It's because Fanatio reminded Dakira of the girl that she once loved that she gained a certain fondness towards her new mentor resulting in the devotion that led her to make the ultimate sacrifice. Anyway, that was the first few notable Integrity Knights. Of course, we still have about five and a half more to talk about. But since I'm not capable of creating multiple 20-minute videos in the same week, I'm gonna have to split this video into two parts. Besides, this was just a video that I felt like making since I've been enjoying SAO so much. Plus, I think I've been uploading a bit too much ReZero content. But there's definitely plenty more I could be talking about for SAO. For now though, I think I'll just be sticking to the weekly ReZero videos. Which, if you want to know what the anime left out from the novels, then I highly recommend you check those out too. In any case, hopefully you enjoyed what you've seen so far. And if you did, then be sure to let me know by dropping a like and leaving a comment. But as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!